Good evening, everybody. My name is Omane Abu, and I work for the City of Glendale Water Services Department. Joining me tonight is Joanne Toms, who also works for the City of Glendale Water Services Department, and Jim Consoloy. Cons Consoli, there we go. Is that right, Jim? Am I messing it up? Jim Consoli. Well, it, it's pronounced Consoloy. Consoloy. Yeah, it's more French. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. So Jim Consoloy and Kaylee with Sonora and Audubon Society. And so I would like to welcome everyone. And the topic for tonight's class is on bird-friendly backyard habitats. And before diving in, we'll want to go over some webinar logistics. So attendees are muted and the class will be recorded. The recording will be available on the city's water conservation website and YouTube channel in about a week. You can type your questions and comments in the Q&A or chat functions um, sections and Joanne and I will read and respond to as many as we can throughout the webinar. We also have Kaylee helping us out tonight as well. The class is scheduled to be one and a half hours long and we have allotted one about one hour for the presentation and about 30 minutes for questions and we will aim to stay on track as we want to be respectful of your time. And if you experience any significant technical difficulties, um, please contact Joanne Toms via email or phone. Her email is jtoms at glendaleaz.com or you can call her at 623-930. 3596. After this presentation, we'll follow up with an email that includes a copy of the PowerPoint, resources, recording, and a link to the survey. And if you complete the survey, you'll be entered in for a chance to win a gift card to a local nursery. And so we want to go over some Zoom attendee features. And so this is what your current view might resemble. You can play around with the features so you're comfortable. You can click and drag the vertical bar located in between the presenter and the presentation to enlarge or shrink the presentation view. You can also adjust the audio settings in the bottom left hand corner of your screen. Feel free to send comments using the chat button or share your questions using the Q&A button. Joanne and I will do our best to answer questions during the presentation as they come in, but we should have enough time for Jim to help answer some questions at the end of his presentation. And I have a free resource that I want to share with you all. So, of course, embracing the Sonoran Desert's unique ecology is important to protecting our region's identity, sense of place, and environment. And this guide makes it fun and easy for homeowners to welcome wildlife to their yards. And you also should have all received this link in your um, class reminder emails. And so you can access this guide and other landscape publications online using the links on the slide, or Glendale residents can request to have a hard copy mailed by filling out the request form. You can also email greenliving at glendaleaz.com, or you can call 623-930-3553. I know that I'm old school, so I always like to have a hard copy. So it's a great option for you that, for those of you that don't want to access a digital copy. And I have some exciting news to share. So this fall, we'll actually be renovating a section of our Xeriscape demonstration garden to include a succulent garden. And so for those who might be joining us for the first time, our demonstration garden surrounds the Glendale Main Library and the renovation will take place just to the east of the library's north entrance. So we are looking for volunteers to help plant succulents. And if you're interested in volunteering, please contact Anne and Staley at a Staley S T A H L E Y at glendaleaz.com. And so enough of me talking. I'm very excited to introduce to you our presenter tonight. So Jim graduated with a bachelor's of science in biology and master's research in horticulture at Rutgers University. Jim's focus was growing ornamental trees and shrubs, as well as managing a wholesale nursery for almost 20 years. Using his background and plant knowledge, Jim was hired by Princeton University as their director of grounds and gardens. Over the next 22 years, he spent time traveling and became more focused on studying birds. In Jim's free time, you'll catch him presenting for municipalities and volunteering. 
Jim has volunteered at the Desert Botanical Garden, San Diego Botanical Garden, and has been involved with the Audubon Society since 1970. So everybody help me give a virtual round of applause to help me welcome Jim. Thanks you so much, Jim, for presenting and joining us tonight. Thank you, Omani. And uh, thank you, um, Glendale. This is a wonderful opportunity for all of us to talk about plants. And of course, plants are my favorite uh, topic, uh, along with birds, of course. But I, I wanted to um, give you a little bit of background. Uh, when we moved here in uh, 2010, uh, the backyard was pretty bare. It was mostly paving and uh, gravel. So I had a few key plants and I had very little knowledge of Arizona plants having uh, grown up in New Jersey along the East Coast um, and uh, studying there as well as working there. So coming uh, west, was a real eye opener for me, not just with new plants to learn, but a lot of new birds to see. So I literally doubled my bird list <laughs> the first couple years here, and I was so excited. Um, and after joining this uh, Sonoran Audubon Society in Glendale, um, they encouraged me to uh, do more planting at home and attract birds uh, through plants and other means to um, welcome them. And in order to create a habitat, I had to do a lot of uh, observation and study, um, not just in our neighborhood, but in the surrounding desert areas. And of course, as you know, the, the valley in, in Phoenix has wonderful opportunities to, to study. So um, transforming my backyard, I'll ask Omani to, to move to the first slide. And um, the, the, um, the cactus that you are looking at right now is called an old man cactus. And I kind of felt uh, close to that plant. I didn't hug it, of course but uh, it has whiskers at the top and those little brown whiskers are basically very soft spines. But the ribs along this commoner cactus are white and sharp. So you, you must uh, take your, um, your garden tools and work around it and, and not get too close because as you well know, the um, <clears throat> the types of, of cacti that grow in our area are uh, not just sharp, but they don't come out of your skin very easily. So I'm, I'm still uh, being very gentle and careful around those plants. Now this plant was one of the key plants and when you start your garden, like any landscape, whether it's a xeriscape landscape or, or not, you want to start with your large plants first and then introduce smaller plants around it. Um, having uh, some experience with uh, keeping the moisture in the ground, I looked for different types of mulches. And uh, the mulch at the base of this cactus happens to be a pine bark mulch. And pine bark leaves uh, over time as it breaks down and acidic soil. And of course, um, the soils in the valley are not acidic, they're very alkaline. So most landscapers recommend using uh, different types of fertilizers with sulfur in them, which kind of acidifies the soil and helps to balance it out. Now in the background, um, my, my backyard is totally walled in, which is secure um, against, uh, well, I thought it would be against coyotes and bobcats and, and javelinas and everything like that. But the rabbits do find their way in. Um, the coyotes easily walk along the walls 
and the bobcats will sit on the walls at night or early in the evening. And they, they too are here for um, basically finding uh, food and, and shelter. So uh, we've sort of invited the entire population <laughs> of, uh, of wildlife to our garden. But as you can see, the, the basic uh, gravel is, is like a, um, a basaltic gravel. And basalt is mostly iron and magnesium, which are two minerals which all plants need. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna look at some of the other plants. I don't know what my cursor, uh, the blue agave, this happens to be the century plant. And in my learning exercise, uh, I found out agaves grow very quickly here and they spread. They send offshoots out. And before I knew it, this whole area was surrounded by agaves. So I've since thinned them out and uh, replaced them with less invasive types of agaves. Agave is an excellent succulent. As, as well as, as cactus and aloes and uh, yuccas and whatnot. The, the plant peeking up over the edge is a blue yucca. And yuccas, this, this particular plant, unlike the century plant, will send up a, a tall stalk. And these stalks are, um, are loaded with uh, a creamy white flower, which are pollinated basically at night by bats. And uh, a lot of our uh, white flowering plants are night pollen uh, are pollinated pollinated by nighttime uh, visitors. Uh, this is an Australian shoestring acacia, which is also a very drought tolerant plant. The, the large tree on the upper right part of the screen is African sumac, um, a plant that, that we've since eliminated from our entire neighborhood because of its allergenic properties. And it's not native. And uh, the sooner we, we uh, were able to remove these trees, the healthier the air quality, and everyone was feeling a little bit better, I think. So um, lantanas in this corner are Central American plants, which have naturalized here in the valley. Um, they are uh, excellent plants that have um, not only uh, a lower water use, but they, they also, um, the petals uh, of which are very uh, nutritious for not only birds, but lizards and, and the entire population of, of smaller invertebrates. So we'll, we'll move to the next slide where um, <clears throat> most of our washes in the, in, um, at least our community, are, um, are uh, outfitted with these uh, river rounds. Some of them are smaller than this. This is three to five inch sizes and the quail easily get around them. I have left bare ground, which is a sandy, dusty uh, caliche. Caliche is a calcium type dust uh, high in clay particles. And if you're familiar with, with uh, most birds uh, love to dust themselves. This is a way of cleaning uh, and smothering the mites and the bird lice that get into their feathers. So having this available for them to scratch in and create these little bowls under them they they actually sit there at night and they they um, they bathe themselves in this dust, so that's important. Again, spiny cactus like like this particular upright form is excellent 
for for housing and shelter for our native uh, native bird, Arizona bird, which is the cactus wren. Uh, it happens to be the largest wren and the most chatty of the wrens uh, in Arizona. So um, we'll move to uh, the next slide. So in part, part, as part of my education, um, I looked into volunteering at the Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix. Um, that was a, a great choice to make. Uh, they, they not only educated me, but they put me to work. And I was able to work with the uh, horticultural crew. And uh, for three years, I studied under their conservators and um, directors in each of the plant collections. So they have um, um, a conservator for cacti, they have one for aloes, and then one for all their, their uh, desert trees and, and that type of large plant material. This particular hybrid choya, and it's pronounced uh, choya, like uh, with a Y, uh, is, a, is a hybrid, but it is native. And, and they do an excellent sign with their signage. Um, uh, they have an excellent signage program. And they, they give you where it is native, when it blooms, what family it happens to be in. And of course, it gives you the botanical family name, Cactaceae. And Cactaceae is a large family with uh, over 2,500 species that they have preserved at the garden. So it's uh, pretty much a lifetime venture to, le to learn and see all these native uh, cacti. In the left-hand corner is, of course, is a, the native compass barrel, which is an upright uh, form of cactus, which tends to grow in the direction of the sun. Again, here's your blue yucca, more yucca plants. And the yuccas are very drought tolerant. Um, as we go uh, north and northwest in Arizona from Phoenix, we run into to other yuccas, uh, such as um, some of the tree form yuccas. The Joshua tree is, is one of the largest. So let's jump to the next slide. I also have um, in the front part of our house a number of shady little niches. And the niche is basically an area for organisms to shelter themselves, find food, and to look for um, other forms of uh, food in those areas. The, the bougainvillea in this corner was uh, a plant, a vine-like plant, which is, uh, has been trimmed as a shrub. If I were to let this go, it would creep over this wall and travel along the wall. Bougainvillea are semi-tropical plants. They are not native. Um, they bloom prolifically if you don't water them. They, they are a stress type of flowering plant. And it comes in many colors as well. But I, I would say uh, it's a high maintenance plant. And um, if you want to reduce your, your maintenance, that would be perfect. Um, I would also like uh, you to, to know that aloe vera is um, another plant which is also a succulent. The thing with aloes is, and this is very important if you're going to raise them, they need about 80 to 90% shade to do really well and to bloom uh, like you see these uh, long flower stalks. This is an excellent um, hummingbird plant. 
but it, it also attracts other types of insects. I tried different ornamental plants in pots, and this happens to be a fall uh, ornamental kale. Ornamental kale is, is not um, um, a high water use plant. I had drip irrigation, and it produced this large flower stalk that went to seed. I had quail sitting in it and other birds trying to nest in the center of this soft mass of growth. So you can experiment and I don't want to stop anyone from trying things. And the, the, um, the padded cactus in, in here happens to be one of the Apuntias and they, they are another form of cactus that are low growing and are great shelter for, for your lizards and geckos and, and those small creeping uh, types of invertebrates. Uh, next slide, please. All of a sudden, um, my first year here, I noticed a number of shells like this all over my garden. Um, when I investigated these particular snails, they were introduced into Arizona because they're predatory snails. And this is a biological control over an invasive snail that damages uh, a lot of our plants. So it goes after the brown, scale, uh, the brown snails and actually eats uh, the, the eggs of the other snail. Uh, biological controls are a great way to reduce um, other insect populations. So if you have uh, insects like praying mantis and um, lace, uh, lace bugs and things like that, all these control um, a lot of your uh, sucking type of insects. Um, particularly insects like aphids, and we'll talk more about them later. Uh, I noticed on this uh, small gallardia, uh, this is a, again a, uh, in the sunflower family, which now is, is considered the aster family. Uh, these particular flower petals are nutritious as well, and a native uh, Native and indigenous people use petals as part of their diet, and they're still a great source of uh, carbohydrate uh, for you. Um, they they also will attract being yellow. They will attract uh, you know certain insects that can see in the yellow range, like most of our bees and wasps and bumblebees. So let's jump to the next slide. When you start feeding, um, you have to uh, look at your property and, and see exactly where you want the, your birds to feed and what type of birds you want to attract. Uh, this was my first year experimenting. So this feeder, um, was uh, very popular at first with finches because I had lots of finches and sparrows, but soon the other birds found it. Uh, these suet cakes in these wire baskets are very popular for our native Gila uh, woodpeckers and the, um, the other types of flickers and, and um, suet feeding birds. They also tend to um, attract uh, your invasive species or foreign birds that have invaded our areas like the European starling and house sparrows and so forth. Um, having uh, some ropes between plants helps to hang uh, your feeders, this particular purple feeder. Um, can you see the uh, hummingbird on the right side? 
this this happens to be a Costa's hummingbird, which adopted this purple uh, nectar feeder, and it still continues after ten years just to visit that purple feeder. So I'm I'm not sure if uh, that range of color is best supported in in the uh, in this form uh, to attract hummingbirds. So you need to uh, you need to look at other insects that you attract to your yard as well. And we'll go to the next slide. And this white crowned sparrow and this morning dove visit oranges that drop from my tree. And as I cut the oranges in half, by the next morning, this whole orange rind is totally void of any fruit. So during the night, uh, we have nighttime visitors, of course, but during the day, uh, just about every bird enjoys fruit. And if, if you uh, find Arizona sweet oranges, in any numbers and quantities, uh, one a day would be helpful. Uh, I found that the, the, uh, there are two birds that, that go to this particular fruit daily during the winter, during their migration here. Uh, one, one is the orange crowned warbler. And this warbler, is it's basically very nondescript, and it's like a an orangish uh, beige color, a little hints of light green and whatnot. But it will share the fruit with the verdans, and we'll we'll see verdans a little later. So let's jump again. Now you may find on. Um, on your tree, on your orange tree, or see along the, the roadside oranges with a large hole. This hole was formed by a curved bill thrasher, which has a, a long curved bill about an inch long, and it's able to open up the fruit and, and get, um, get what it needs in, in terms of, of juice and, and nutrients out of the orange. So I'll take this, this particular orange and slice it uh, in half and then flip it over. And again, they, they will eat every single bit of it. Um, in two days, that rind will be like a little leather pouch. Um, again, you can see the snails, they crawl around in the wood chips. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that um, I, I don't uh, have these wood chips any longer, not because I got rid of them, but during the course of the last 10 summers, the neighborhood pack rats have taken them all. And this, this was a surprise to me, but I did find a pack rat midden. A midden is a pile of debris collected by the pack rat and these rats will, um, again, build all night long. They disappear during the day. You'll never know you have them until you see things missing. And some of the pack rat middens that I have seen are, are, are three and four feet tall and about five feet wide. So they, they become uh, very old with age. And some of the some of the older ones actually have uh, a lot of interesting artifacts in the middle. The McDowell Sonoran uh, Preserve has a, a pack rat midden there for you to to visit. So that that's another uh, source of information. They have great interpretive signage. So uh, a visit to that particular side of the valley would be worth uh, spending a day. Good hiking there too. 
we can move on. Now, many neighborhoods do not want you to feed because they attract pigeons. Pigeons are uh, very aggressive birds. They also will spoil um, a lot of your uh, hardscape as well as your house and roof and, and whatnot. So uh, in order to um, discourage them, I have a, a five gallon uh, container, a, a regular uh, container that uh, is like a pail and I flip it over on top of my quail block uh, every night. And this keeps the uh, nighttime feeders away from the seed and prolongs the life of that quail block. So again, I took a picture of this, uh, this one a visiting uh, rock pigeon who uh, could not find his, uh, his dinner and he took off not to come back. We, um, we also have a few native uh, palm trees and the palms grow south um, uh, along the um, Arizona-Mexican border. It is a native plant. And this particular fan palm uh, with fan-shaped leaves will drop uh, thousands and thousands of its uh, small nut, uh, miniature little coconuts, which are soft when they fall. And every single one of those gets eaten during the winter months. Um, the, uh, the bird that enjoys this the most, I would say, is the mockingbird. So the fan palms, and a lot of people uh, discourage you from planting fan palms because they do uh, uh, take uh, a lot of water, but the roots also extend for quite an extensive area and they, they will suck up water but they also will retain it in, in their um, vast vasculature inside their trunks. So we can move on. Again, some visitors to the quail block, uh, Inca doves, um, again, the European sparrows, house sparrows are popular. Um, I, I tried to reduce uh, the feeding time and you can control that. And wire baskets help as well as uh, water pails. Again, uh, these are in a sunny location in the open. And this way I, I can watch from the house and observe what, what birds are actually feeding. Um, I've had over 30 species of birds in my backyard uh, in, in uh, one year's count. And these include visiting hawks as well as uh, migratory species. Um, can we move on please? So this is the other corner uh, of the garden showing the orange tree um, in, in these shady areas, uh, you'll see I have a saguaro growing here. Um, I have a, another uh, Peruvian cactus here, a large columnar cactus there. And I'm, I'm trying different types of um, cacti uh, in containers first and then moving them. Every summer, I cover this container with shade cloth and 50% shade works very good to keep these plants alive. This plant gets about 40% shade and then I add some shade cloth there. This happens to be one of the blue junipers. Having evergreens, uh, plants that are cone bearing, 
uh, present a different type of environment in your garden. They acidify the soil around them. I have since created a bed around here and introduced aloes because it's very shady. So um, my garden is a work in progress. This orange tree, um, again, requires about 400 gallons of water a month. And I have a basin around it. And I have to, in order to get the oranges to feed the birds, uh, I do have to, to supply water. So um, this particular tree is very dense. And at night, when I go outside, there are many birds, mostly um, smaller birds, that are roosting in these dense uh, trees. And in the Sun Cities, uh, Bell Webb had, had given every single homeowner two fruit trees, whether they were lemons, grapefruits, oranges, or whatever, but, but they provide a lot of shelter. Uh, this is another corner of the garden a uh, yellow bells, uh, orange bells. This is a juniper. Um, I, I have a number of different uh, sky flowers. These are uh, blue. Uh, Porosia, which is the Russian sage, very fragrant. And this ground cover, which uh, one of the garden club members gave me is myoporum. Um, I wasn't sure how it was going, going to do. Uh, came back uh, in the early fall one year. It had surrounded this entire area, and I had nesting rabbits in, in holes all over throughout this area. So the rabbits um, were able to take control over things, and um, they do a lot of nibbling, but Basically, they they haven't um, they haven't uh, damaged any of my uh, succulents as well. Can we uh, can we move to um, oh I wanted to mention boulders, um, large boulders, and I inherited a lot of them because I also inherited this water feature. And it's basically a, a, a large concrete flat pan with um, a waterfall that comes down and, and drips over into a basin that I buried partly in the ground. So it creates a lot of noise. It does attract birds. I have, uh, I have hummingbirds bathing in it, uh, as well as burdens and other birds woodpeckers and whatnot, they'll come and sit under the waterfall and particularly in the warmer weather. And of course our water is warm to begin with. So that, that was um, interesting. But the, um, the large boulders and all the crevices and cracks and crannies attract the lizards. And this is like the lizard highway through the back here, under here, uh, I have a nectar feeder in the shade, which keeps the, the, um, the sugar water cool. And you can see this, this uh, northwest facing wall has shade uh, most of the day. I keep pots in the garden and I have them on drip irrigation. The water that goes through the pots and into the ground water the cypress they water the palms, they water this totem pole cactus. And um, I've become fond of a lot of cacti. Uh, so this particular one is the Indian fig cactus, which has the large red fruit. So I'm going to, um, to move on to the next slide and see what, um, what other water features we have um, in the area. This one doesn't have them, but uh, this particular um, 
<clears throat> excuse me, happens this um, bird bath happens to be all metal. And I had this out the first year. And of course, the water evaporated within one hour. <laughs> and I thought this is going to be futile trying to keep water in it. So I kept the quail block up here. And I was able to keep um, uh, some of the birds feeding up top where I could see them. And then it was easy for me to cover it at, not, at night. Um, this particular cypress is a hotel for not just the doves and the sparrows and the finches and murdens and everyone, but its dense properties um, attract, uh, attract a lot of shade loving uh, insects. And these, uh, these birds are constantly moving throughout this large, commoner Mediterranean cypress. Um, these get quite large. Uh, cypress are, uh, again, not native, but they are low water use evergreens. Jim, again, can I inter inter interject real quick? Um, the attendees aren't able to see your cursor since I'm sharing the presentation for you. So when you're um, talking about certain plants, can you describe the location where it is in the picture? Oh, okay. Yay, thank you, Jim. I, I, can, I can let you use the cursor. Yes, or you want me to use it? Continue. Yeah, if you could just say like, if you're talking about Cypress or like another plant in the picture, if you could just describe like where the, the location is in the picture so the attendees can follow along. Okay, um, this happens to be an interesting cactus. And right now that cactus uh, is taller than the wall. So it, it's slow growing, but it's also a, a very, um, very good succulent plant. The, um, I inherited this Buddha and the Buddha happens to be a resting spot for some of the ground birds. Um, oftentimes I'll see the curb bill thrasher sitting on his head. But um, these two large fan palms uh, were already existing in my backyard. And they, they do attract termites from time to time. But I found uh, by working and uh, and using various types of non-invasive methods, um, I'm able to remove termites immediately just by simple um, uh, isopropyl alcohol in a spray bottle, 50-50. And they, they will eliminate different forms of scale organisms. Uh, choyas like this particular choya happens to be um, one of the chain fruit types. They get a scale organism called cochineal. Cochineal scales are white, and those white scales can easily be reduced with alcohol. So alcohol is gentle isopropyl rub rubbing alcohol is gentle on not only plants, but on, you know, succulents and leaves and um, other, um, other forms of, uh, you know, bark and, and whatnot. So that's something that um, I've used um, since I've been in Arizona. And I have a spray bottle in my collection of, uh, of bins and, and uh, storage units. Again, this is the south, or this is the northwest side of the wall, and you can see how much shade I'm getting. And uh, my cactus seedlings will survive. In the wild, cactus seedlings will be found under other plants uh, throughout throughout the desert. If you if you look uh, at, for example, a large wolfberry shrub in the desert. You'll usually find barrel cactus under there, or you'll find other padded cactus. Uh, sometimes the saguaros and the Mexican saguaros, uh, the cardones, 
will start um, under other plants and trees. Okay, next slide, please. Again, another view of the, of the fountain area. And you can see um, how uh, the backside, again, is full of heavy rocks, which oftentimes at the top, you'll see the, the, um, the different lizards. I, I have at least three different types of lizards and geckos and whatnot, but the geckos hide the lizards come out uh, in the sunny part of the day and they sun themselves. The collared lizard is the most popular. Um, again, this is a, a winter uh, watering station, but um, again, by um, mid-March, I have to put it in the shade and I don't use it for water. So, um, this fresh water will attract uh, so many uh, different forms of wildlife. Um, uh, this, this particular uh, red flowering plant is not native and I wanted to try it. It's called for, uh, Coral Fountain. And Coral Fountain is, um, is a, a, a semi-tropical California, Hawaii um, plant that does really well there. I have it next to the fountain because when I fill the fountain, I give it a drink and I don't waste water that way. Um, it, it's very popular with the hummingbirds because again, it has these tiny tube-shaped flowers. There are other native plants with similar tube-like flowers but this is uh, the botanical name for this is Rosalia, Rosalia. Um, again, some small cactus tucked in and vinca. Uh, this is a hardy form of vinca. Next slide, please. I found this at a plant sale in the neighborhood. It's a large uh, scallop shape water feature and I have it partially buried but I have it resting on rocks so that the lizards can get under it for shade. It's nice and cool under there. Uh, the main issue I have with that is um, the algal spores in the air here because we have a number of golf courses surrounding us um, and their ponds get loaded with algae. And the algal spores are attached to uh, a lot of the legs of the, the birds that are moving, moving through the area. This is another chain fruit choya. The white on it is the cochineal scale. Cochineal scale is uh, was a hidden secret that the, um, the early Spaniards found in Mexico. Um, the juice from this scale insect is a brilliant red color. So when you squish the scale, which is very soft, it produces this red dye. And the red dye had been used for centuries as a dye um, used in, in Central and Northern South America. Um, it was hidden because the Spaniards were able to sell this particular dye to the, the uh, English, and the English used it, of course, to dye their red coats. You can do the same thing. Don't get it on your hands. It's very hard, hard to get to remove. So, Here's another slide of that mulch. Um, when I scratched the mulch up, it would have all types of insects and ants and, and various uh, types of small <clears throat> invertebrates. And I love seeing that because that was food for the birds. Next slide, please. 
um, oftentimes I'd leave uh, debris on the ground. If you clean up everything to, to make the area too sterile, it doesn't encourage uh, a lot of natural uh, visitors and whatnot. So this particular sheath from a palm tree, I save and I'll put it in different areas where it's hot and sunny. And if I have a, a, this pine cone cactus, for example, um, I had a cutting and this particular cutting um, I cut off at the joint and jointed cactus like this padded cactus has a narrowing point called the joint. You can trim these and then repropagate from them. And this is, this is a very, uh, very sure way of creating more plants. Uh, these are called bunny ears and bunny ears have glochids. So these white uh, particular uh, patches on the pad are a mass of tiny, tiny fish hook type spines that immediate, uh, immediately are released and attached to your clothing, your gloves, your skin, uh, <laughs> anything they come in contact with. But they were very painful to get out as well. So you, uh, this is another succulent uh, cactus that uh, you may want to be careful in uh, actually where you plant it. So it's not on the beaten path. Uh, next uh, next slide. Uh, these are all, <clears throat> these are all uh, different types of uh, perching places I have um, in my garden, and I won't go through them because so many of them are uh, just pretty obvious, and and um, you can um, you can put your perches in areas. Um, that you can see from your windows in your house so that uh, as you're busy moving about, you can see what's visiting. Next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> for example, this metal plant stake uh, has a little uh, shepherd's hook on the top and has a silhouette of a bird this happens to be the, the um, Costa hummingbird with a purple gorget. Uh, it also likes perching on metal stakes. I have a few metal stakes where I need to prop up cactus that are uh, uh, sort of overhead uh, before I prune them. Uh, I'll get them in a stable position. Next, please. Uh, again, if I cut off a dead branch or something, I, I'll leave it in areas where I know uh, the hummingbirds will, will uh, rest. This side of the garden in the shade is my costa area. <laughs> so uh, the costas uh, fly back and forth over the, the lizard alley uh, run and uh, the, the different types of uh, evergreens. This again, this is the the uh, blue juniper, which again uh, attracts the hummingbirds. And I prune the inside of these these junipers so that the bare stems are easily perchable. If that's a word. So um, this this hummer will visit the the nectar feeder and fly inside uh, for cover, particularly when there, there are other hummingbirds in the area. Next slide, please. <clears throat> in certain parts of the country, um, particularly, in, particularly in parks and uh, natural forest areas, um, they're encouraged to leave dead standing trees. Um, these provide so much food. 
because all the cracks and crevices and parts of, <clears throat> of the bark that's exfoliating uh, harbor many insects. Uh, these, uh, this happens to be a Gila woodpecker who likes to rest here, but it will also, uh, <clears throat> you'll also see it feeding along these perching uh, dead stems. <clears throat> Or their perches are uh, often this heavy one will have a uh, a small bird hawk there, like a sharp shinned or Cooper's hawk. Uh, that that's <clears throat> that's the native uh, hawk in uh, most of the valley. A very popular uh, bird you'll see flying uh, behind houses and from park to park. Um, other other plants, um, native mesquites and Palo Verde and uh, ironwood are all found. Um, mostly mesquite are along the, the uh, rivers and wadis where they need their roots in the, in the deep uh, moist soil. Palo Verdes will be up on higher edges. Ironwood will be out on the flats and the desert willows will, will also be um, you know, in in areas along rivers and whatnot. But if you leave dead limbs, um, it is beneficial for the for birds and insects. Next slide, please. Uh, this native cactus wren, uh, the state bird of Arizona, found my cactus and started building a nest and. I have um, have seen it recently as as uh, much as three three days uh, three days ago. Um, it is a wonderful uh, welcoming bird to hear uh, when you get back home. They do love these columnar uh, spiny cactus. This <clears throat> this happens to be uh, a type of organ pipe. Uh, the organ pipes, uh, you can tell because they have numerous ribs, as many as eight, eight or 12 ribs um, to each plant. Next slide, please. Um, Acatillo, <clears throat> also called the coach whip, uh, these long slender stems. Um, are void of leaves when it's very hot and dry. The minute that you have rain or add water to it, they become very, um, very, uh, very green. So you can see how these birds uh, are using this very uh, thorny plant. These, uh, they don't have spines, but they have thorns. So they're in the, uh, the botanical world, world, there are uh, many descriptions of these uh, different thorns. For example, roses do not have thorns, they have prickles. So if, if you're a rose grower, you'll know what a prickle is. But <clears throat> thorns are mostly found on trees. Um, this this uh, particular large acatillo uh, happens to be a resting place because the birds can drop here inside and the next slide will show uh, some of the some of the density of these uh, particular plants. So this is that same plant with water and you can see that the uh, these spiny, very spiny, um, they're not actually thorny uh, stems, multiple stem plants. And this happens to be after a rain uh, on the wall. Um, again, our local uh, Campbell quail uh, found this as, as a great resting place. Uh, this happens to be uh, during the uh, late spring. I love Acatillo. 
it's a great plant and they have um they have some uh wonderful red suck um not succulent but very um sweet inflorescences and then inflorescence is a uh collection of flowers on a stalk so when you have multiple flowers uh, attached to a stalk uh, we call that an inflorescence and uh, a stalk on a century plant is actually that is an inflorescence as well they're quite large next slide please uh, this is back at the uh, Desert Botanical Garden where they can grow large crown of thorns. Uh, again, this particular plant is not native. It's from uh, Madagascar, but a lot of the South African plants uh, that are at latitude 33 to 35 South latitude will grow in the Phoenix area. We just happen to be the, the 33 to 34 degree north latitude. So we can, we can use any plant, we can grow any plant uh, growing around the world in either the northern or the southern hemisphere, Australia, South Africa, the Mediterranean, uh, just follow that line around the globe. And if the, if the plant grows in along that, particular line, uh, it will grow in, in our area. Again, crown of thorns. Next slide, please. This is, um, I thought I should just leave this slide up for a little bit. You can um, read this on your own, but um, <clears throat> These are the, the, um, the plants that are recommended uh, for attracting hummingbirds to your yard. We do have a handout and uh, the handout will give you that, that list as well. Shrubs that, uh, and trees that attract small insects and, and actually, uh, you would be surprised at the number of insects, not just the bees that, that go to the, um, the uh, citrus plants. And uh, citrus, uh, if you want to grow citrus, they're, um, they're another plant that is considered a shrub because, because of uh, the where the, the fruit on the plant grows but pomegranate is another native plant and pomegranates are are loved by uh, many of the uh many of our birds as well as uh, desert uh, ironwood flowers um, don't forget to grow uh plants that produce these fluffy seed parachutes as nesting material and Desert broom comes to mind. Uh, yeah, Kelly mentioned the the beautiful purple flowers on uh, the ironwood trees. Um, uh, the the early citrus growers um, used ironwood as a key plant in which they would know. Um, where citrus would grow the best. If the ironwood tree would not survive in that area, neither would citrus. So uh, ironwood are sensitive to heat and uh, soil temperature. So um, you'll notice that um, the soil temperature create, uh, plays a critical part in how, how plants uh, will uh, form and, and how plants will continue to grow. Um, desert milkweed, uh, pine needle milkweed, and, and those types of plants are important as well, not just for your butterflies, 
but for attracting other types of, of bees and insects. Uh, what I was surprised to learn as part of my education at the DBG was uh, there are 600 species of uh, bees in Arizona along, alone. Um, just about all of these bees nest in the ground. And most of them are single. They're not uh, formed in swarms like the, Europe, the European honeybee or the Mexican honeybee. They, they actually are swarming bees. So the other bees are, are individuals. And uh, just today from pruning um, in my chuparosa, I noticed this unusual bee I had never seen before, but until I uncovered some of the uh, heavier growth, I never would have noticed this bee uh, hugging the stem of the chuparosa. I just want um, you to know that there are many forms of aloes that are available, but again, remember they need shade. Next slide, please. And hey, Jim. So, I mean, time is flying by, so I can't believe it's already 635. Okay. So let's go until 650. So that way we at least have about 10 minutes for questions. I think we're handling the questions in the Q&A and chat pretty well, but just in case um, there's any last minute questions, we can at least dedicate the last 10 minutes to any questions that pop up. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's start. Okay, I'll go to the next slide, but just if we can just do 15 more minutes of presentation and then open up to Q&A. Okay, next slide then. Okay, here's a close up of your uh, tubular flowers. Um, Cape honeysuckle happens to be South African, but it does so well in our area. Uh, that the growers continue to produce this plant. The Mexican honeysuckle is native south of here. Um, it's very hard to find uh, in the desert because I think um, <clears throat> a lot of the areas in the Phoenix area, uh, we have too many um, wild burrows. <laughs> the wild burrows seem to eat <laughs> everything. And uh, it's hard to find a lot of native plants, uh, particularly wolfberries and whatnot. If you go down to the Gilbert um, Water Park area, uh, another place to visit, you'll see large wolfberries there. But if, um, <clears throat> if you notice, these plants have a lip petal. There's a lip here, there's a lip here, and these are actually places that the plant uh, actually developed and evolved as resting places for the insects so that they can uh, get into the, they can crawl down into the, the tube and feed on the nectar at the bottom. The, um, the larger, like the, uh, the large bumblebees actually hug the base of the plant and they use their proboscis or their, their long piercing mouth to suck the uh, sugars out of the base of the plant, of the flower, I'm, sure, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, the, these flowers usually um, only last one day and uh, a hummingbird can get one or two drinks and that's it. And then this, this uh, particular flower is spent. The same with uh, this form of Justicia um, spicegera um, is a relative to the chuparosa, which is the red flowering one, which I just talked about. Next slide. Again, Cape honeysuckle and lantana. Um, lantanas um, are, again, an inflorescence of small tubular flowers. The downside of lantana is 
the, the leaves, stems, and parts of the plant are toxic to animals. They're toxic to dogs. They're toxic to, to many of the local wildlife, rabbits particularly. The flowers, petals, are not. The, the seeds are toxic. Next slide, please. Here is, uh, again, a, a fairy duster native um, hybrid. This one is red. The more native one has the pink stamens. And if the stamen is the male structure with the, with the pollen produced in the anther at the top. And this becomes the pollen tube that grows down inside the flower to the male or to the female part of the flower, which happens to contain sugar. So a hummingbird is able to stab its, uh, its bill into this and then stick its tongue in and suck the juice out of these sweet, uh, sweet flowers. Again, this is a leguminous plant. Uh, they have rows of leaflets on each stem, uh, being a compound stem. You know it's a legume. This would be a seed pod, a green seed pod with, with the seeds in it. Next slide, please. Okay, more tubular flowers, penstemons. Um, Again, these, these are uh, pictures that um, I, I had taken uh, at various gardens. Uh, the Haciampa River Preserve is another place to visit that has a wonderful interpretive garden of native plants. So you, you may want to put that on your, your uh, list of, of places to see and, and uh, hike, wonderful trails. This happens to be the Haciampa River Preserve. It's now a Maricopa County Park in Wickenburg. So it's, it's on Route 60, just a little bit uh, east of Wickenburg. And it's very easy to find. Again, the, uh, there is a, a, a county park fee. Thank you, Kelly. Next slide, please. Uh, Binka, uh, I, I just pointed out, this is a very um, hot uh, desert type of perennial. Uh, it's a ground cover. My uh, objection to this plant is that uh, very few um, that I have seen, very few uh, birds visit this plant, but it is a good ground cover and keeps the soil uh, in good condition, um, provides cover for lizards and uh, field mice and, and other of uh, visiting uh, critters. Yeah, uh, for example, a bumblebee may jump onto this large tubular flower. Next slide, please. Again, more orange. This is uh, again uh, taken at the Haciampa River Preserve. Um, uh, this uh, small yellow uh, buttercup type ranunculus type flower uh, attracts bees and flies and whatnot. Next slide, please. Uh, yellow bells and orange bells. I planted the two together and I wanted to see as, as an experiment which would do better the orange bells actually took over. My yellow bells is, is way down, uh, crowded out. 
So this happens to be the faster growing. Um, the, um, going back, I'm not um, familiar with the California fuchsia, but most of the garden at the, at the Haciampa is in the sun. So I'm going to say that it probably has uh, the fuchsias need um, at least uh, at least 50% uh, sun or better. Next slide, please. Uh, this is my verdant habitat, and I have my uh, orange beater hanging in in this area. I tried Arizona cypress. Um, I love this plant. I actually brought, bought one in New Jersey and planted it at the university where I, I was uh, working. Uh, there was an area that one of the science buildings had a lot of vents, um, mostly blowing hot air out along this wall. And the uh, chairman of the department asked for a garden out there. So I, I took a Arizona cypress plant, which I was able to buy from a grower in the uh, Washington DC area. I planted it, it's now three stories high. Uh, I would never have guessed, but it loves that hot, warm, dry air and the good moist soil. So um, it's, a, it's a great plant. Um, burdens are um, a, a very um, active and uh, fast moving small bird about the size of a chickadee. It feeds upside down. It eats a lot of insects and insect eggs. So it's a good plant to have in your garden. They, they do a good job on getting some of those, uh, those um, very um, uh, persistent types of insects from sucking on, on a lot of your plants. Next slide, please. Um, I just thought I'd throw this in because my neighbor loved roses and he planted Elysium at the bottom. But uh, between the geckos and the roly polies, which are the sow bugs, my, my grandkids call uh, the sow bugs roly polies because when you, when you pick them up, they turn into a ball and they, they, uh, they hide that way. But um, I get lots of bees and the leaf cutter bee, which is native to the area, loves roses. So if you look at your rose leaf and the, the edge of it is serrated, you can thank that leaf cutter bee because he's enjoyed your roses. And he leaves the, the basic part of the, the leaf intact and it doesn't affect the bloom or the, uh, the budding or the, uh, the flowers. Next slide, please. Um, this plant is uh, also uh, mainly California and uh, again, in areas where you have a lot of water. Um, the, the, uh, this plant uh, is in the sumac family, but it's a very friendly uh, type of sumac in, in that, that it produces these sugar berries, which are very sweet. And, and many, of the, many of our local wildlife enjoy them and the birds I'm sure enjoy them as well. Russo Veda. Rus family is a large family, uh, which happens to also um, be uh, the family that the African sumac is in, which uh, we've slowly reduced to uh, very few numbers in our, our city. Next slide, please. Um, again, uh, another form of aloe. This is maculata. Uh, zebra aloe, this little candelabra of inflorescent uh, type spikes uh, are again are very sweet. 
flowers, hummingbirds will visit them daily. And they spread uh, throughout your garden. I've tried other agaves in this area, different types of agaves as well. So it's still work in progress. But I do like this zebra aloe. Next slide, please. A close up of the aloe flowers with these long tube, uh, tube shape, uh, unopened flowers. They open from the bottom to the top. So as the stalk grows, the flower buds mature, and eventually the last flower to open is at the top. And then the stem looks like this it's just dead. But the hummers can perch on that sideways or, or other birds as well. Next slide, please. Another close up of, of the zebra aloe. Next, oh, uh, this is red yucca. And red yucca has another inflorescence of red flowers. Some are pink, some are yellow. So um, another popular plant in the valley is the red yucca. Next slide. Palms, date palms. Again, they're high water use, so you have to uh, realize what palms will do. These are a date palm. And they do produce fruit, dates. Coyotes love them. Next slide. Um, I didn't want to miss the two types of palm pine trees, uh, the uh, lepo pine and the Afghan pine are native to the Mediterranean area. So um, the, these plants are cone bearing plants and along with the cones, they acidify the soil and they, they're great places for uh, birds to perch. This particular tree, uh, I call the owl tree because at night, the great horned owl rests in there and the awesome calls from there. Next slide. Close up of the pines. Again, here's a finch in, in here, happens to be a house finch, which house finches are Asian birds. Desert hackberry couldn't not mention this plant. It, it's uh, a plant you can visit uh, at the Desert Botanical Garden. These, these uh, nice uh, sugary fruits are uh, often just uh, uh, cleaned up very efficiently by the local birds. And it's on many of the bird walks because you're, you're almost certain to find birds next to this tree. This is the desert hackberry. Um, the hackberries throughout the North American range are all called sugar berries because of their sweet fruit. And they're very popular. They, they grow wild along the river valleys. And some of the trunks on them are eight feet in diameter. So they get to be a huge tree. Next slide, please. All right, Jim, maybe we should pause there since we're coming up at, it's already 6.54, and I wanna make sure we have enough time to answer questions. Okay. Or is there any slides that you wanted to share? I think we have about like 10 slides left. Is there any at the end that you want me to run to real quick? Well, um, if you wanna end up on the last slide, it's sort of... Um... And everyone will be sending, um, the slides in the email, so you'll be able to look at yeah. these slides. We can go back to the uh, slide with the other hummingbird. If, oh, this is the last slide, but we can go back to the hummingbird because I did, people do ask about nectar and I wanted to make some points about making ne making your own nectar. If, can you go back or oh, is that? Which? That, yeah, that one, um, the broad bill. Well, you can go back to the broad bill. Yeah, that one. Um, this happens to be at Madeira Canyon. 
where they have so many nectar feeders. And their, their formula is one cup of granular white sugar to four cups of water. And what I do, normally do is I start with one cup of warm water, hot water, and I dissolve the sugar, and then I add the other three cups of cooler water, and then keep that in my refrigerator. And this, this food is always available. So if, if you want, be sure to clean your feeder every time. These bills from going from flower to flower are loaded with pollen and algal spores and bacteria and fungal spores. And every time they stick their bill down in here, they kind of wash it off. <laughs> and you often, often see the hummingbirds rubbing from side to side on branches and the sugar gets sticky on their bill and they need to wash it off. So then they head over to the, the fountain and the water uh, source and clean their bill a little bit better. But they deposit the, um, the bacterial and fungal spores into the sugar. And the sugar is an excellent medium for growing these, uh, these types of, uh, of uh, invasive bacteria and fungi. So um, cleaning them and using a, a, a small brush and you can buy the hummingbird brushes uh, that clean the holes in your feeder and use a light, a very, very light um, solution of, of uh, hydrochloric, uh, sodium hydro hydrochloride, which is common bleach, but like only 1%. So a very light bleach and then rinse it very well. And that cleans out your feeder. So we can go from there. <laughs> oh, very neat. Oh, wow. And um, we actually, I want to thank you for just sharing your wealth of knowledge and just experience about bringing pollinators and birds to our backyards. I mean, this was so exciting, so much information, a lot of great imagery for our attendees to look into and just to experiment with their own backyards. And so entering the Q&A portion, uh, kind of going off of the hummingbird um, feeder and about the, their diet, um, someone had a question about, do mosquitoes breed in the fountain? Because you had a picture um, earlier on in the presentation about mosquitoes. And I know the water needs to be changed pretty regularly to prevent breeding, but have you had any experience with mosquitoes breeding in your um, bird baths? Yeah, uh, your water has to be uh, changed probably at, at least um, every other day. Um, I would rinse out my, um, my one bird bath because as you well know, the birds love to take baths <laughs> and they are not that clean. And you, you um, I found an area where I uh, place my water baths, my bird baths, where when I rinse it, the rinsate from the bath actually waters my fruit tree and my palm tree. So they're all in areas where as I'm uh, hosing them out and putting fresh water in, then um, you know that that water is is uh, used uh, by by the uh, larger plants. Uh, about once a month, I need to empty it and take that that one percent bleach solution with a scrub brush and uh, scrub it out, and I, I rinse them out on a hard surface and let, let that uh, basically uh, evaporate. Mm -hmm. So uh, frequent cleaning is very important. You want your birds to stay healthy. Um, I have to empty my fountain at least once a month too, because the bottom fountain um, in the basin, I have a drain and, the, and there's a large gravel sump, almost like a um, rain garden sump of, of rocks. And I drain that into that sump with a light 
again, using that very light bleach solution. Um, you can use vinegar, you can use baking soda, and you can use a number of other um, very uh, common cleaning, uh, old fashioned cleaning solutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You've gotten a lot of us, a lot of, you've given us a lot of knowledge to work with. And I think one other question that came through, and apologies if I'm missing any other questions that came through, was someone asked what was planted at the bottom of a rose plant. So I'm wondering what slide that was. I think it was bottom, planted near the bottom of a rose plant. Was it? Oh, that, that's a purple Elysium. Elysium. A-L-L-Y-S-U-M, uh, Alyssum. Oh, perfect. Oh, yep, and George got it in the chat too. Oh, I love the teamwork here. Thanks, everyone. Um, is there any other questions? Um, I'll give you all a few seconds to type them in. And during that time, I'll just do some closing remarks, but I'll keep the eye out for any last minute questions before we break for tonight. But again, I wanna thank Jim and I wanna thank Kaylee for coming out today to present and to share their knowledge with us all. I know I'm inspired to have more pollinators come to my garden to visit, especially with the nice weather out. You can't help but wanna be outside. So it's perfect timing. Mm -hmm. And so just a reminder to people who might have joined later um, this evening that are recording the slides, um, any resources that were shared in the chat tonight will be sent up in a follow up email. So be on the lookout for that. A recording will be made available about a week after the class. So it will take some time. Um, so just be on the lookout for that. And our next class coming up, which is our fall finale, is Growing Fruit Trees in the Desert, which is happening um, Wednesday, October 27th from 5.30 to 7 p.m. So that'll be our fall finale. And then we'll also be showing and debuting our classes coming up for the spring. So be, await, be, be excited about the unveiling of those um, classes as they become available. Um, Right now, I just see a lot of great comments. Jim and Kaylee, great presentation. Thank you. Thanks for the information. Excellent presentation. So informative and, help, and helpful. Thank you. And thank you in a smiley face. It was really interesting. Thanks so much. Great information. So thank you all again for attending. Really appreciate you joining us tonight. And we will catch you at the next class. And have a good evening. Bye, everybody.